The program is Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb, your host for the next half hour as we bring you public affairs at its best right here from WKYU PBS. Our guest on today's program has been called one of the best American essayists of our time. But what does that really mean in today's culture? We'll talk about that. A lone wolf who shuns the pack, doesn't kowtow to political correctness, author and frequent contributor to the PBS NewsHour, his name is Richard Rodriguez. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Barbara. We're pleased to have you. You are in the area as a guest of the WKU Cultural Enhancement Series to talk about a number of issues. But one issue in particular that I want to talk about with you is education, because education for you has been so much a part of who you are and what you are. It's the journey I've taken. I, I've, I've, my first book is a book called Hunger Memory, which is a book about growing up working class, the son of parents who had very little formal schooling. My father had two years of uh, elementary school education. Um, and um, what education does to a child who comes from that kind of home. Now, in many ways, my, my story was a success story. That is, I went to a Roman Catholic school with Irish nuns who were determined that I was going to speak English, who were determined that I was going to succeed in America. And I did. And it's a happy story. Well, wait, except, are you the exception or the rule when well, you say what, I, the story that story. I t end up telling is the story of just how much pain that causes when the child begins to learn the English language better than his parents when the child begins to uh, have more confidence in public than his parents when the child begins to assume the, the role of adulthood over his parents you know because of the language because the of language, the grasp the of the skills, language and the skills you go to a school where the teacher will say don't use a double negative. You go home and that's what your parents are doing and you had to decide which language am I going to use, the language of home or the language of school. That, that journey which millions of American kids have taken from Appalachia to, to South Central LA, that journey is largely repressed. We don't talk about it because we, we, we all want to become middle class and we built universities like this where we can become middle class. But it's a journey of loss as much as, as it is a journey of gain. A journey of loss. Uh, very poignant. Your book is called Hunger of Memory, The Education of Richard Rodriguez. If you don't mind, this is an excerpt from the book. It's uh, page 55. It's in the chapter, The Achievement of Desire. And in this, if you would just read that for me. You wrote that. It's about, like you say, a lot of loss that you had to suffer in an effort to get to the place where you are Yes, today. this is, uh, you know, these people always were telling me as I began to become successful as a little bratty student, your parents must be very proud of you. People began to say that to me about the time that I was in sixth grade. To answer affirmatively, I'd smile. Shyly, I'd smile. I always learned that shyness as a, as a, as a little device, never betraying my sense of the irony. I was not proud of them, my mother and father. I was embarrassed by their lack of education. It was not that I thought they were ever stupid, though stupidly I took for granted their enormous native intelligence. Simply what mattered to me was that they were not like my teachers. So there you were in school, the teachers were telling you one thing, but you knew when you went home that's not what you saw at home. So it comes down almost to a, a sense of loyalty as well. There you, is that, there yeah. is that. I never had a, a number of kids, in England there's a term called a scholarship boy, and that's what I was. America doesn't use that term very much, but, but there are a number of students who are discouraged when they come home from that academic success, who are, you know, you're not going to use that voice here. You're not going to speak white here. You're not going you know, to use that fancy, those fancy words here, where the student really is challenged not to be the student when he comes home. I never got that. But I got the, the, the sense that I knew, what should I say, a kind of, a kind of anxiety of, of becoming too much the adult too soon. A disconnect of sorts, yeah. uh, self-imposed in many cases, but it was this, this disconnect that you're saying that a lot of students today have. Yes. It, we're in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Our schools in this area speak more than 27 languages are spoken in the schools here. So, I mean, this is not the exception anymore. This is the rule. This I mean, this is the story. And there's also, I mean, Bowling Green has been part of a, uh, uh, there's a story in America that doesn't get told, and that's poor white. You know, well, there's a, there, there are dialect forms of American English, which a lot of kids learn in working class homes. It's not standard uh, English that you learn in school, conventional middle class English, not this voice that I'm using, but, the, but an accented voice. And what schools try to do is essentially beat it out of you. 
to try to train assimilate. your voice. Assimilate? That's right, assimilate, become middle class. And to the extent that we, we are successful with these students, we strip them of their past. Well, let's talk about, I, I kind of wanted to get into that later, but let's talk about it now. Just, you know, the nature of ethnicity today, if I could say it, the nature of ethnicity today. How has this culture clash changed from when we were growing up to what it is today? Well, I'm older than you, but what, <laughs> so, <laughs> I think. Um, I think it's changed in that there is a sense, certainly when I went to school, I went to a, a white middle class school. I w we were this sort of on the periphery of that neighborhood. So uh, there was no sense of being Mexican at that school. There was a sense of being ethnic. Um, different? There, different. Uh, there were Indians from India at, in the school. There were some Chinese. And I, I sensed my difference with them. But the nuns, the Catholic nuns, were from Ireland. And they were, they were like me in the sense that they they were from the outside. They spoke I an accented English and so forth. So it wasn't exactly um, like going to a, a school now in America where there's an enor a population of people just like you, um, all Hispanic or all black or all Chinese, as you do in some parts of the country. I rather like the idea of the Bowling Green example of you go to a school where there are d schools, people from all over. But I still think that the problem is not simply the diversity of the classroom, it's the, the, the home classroom situation, whether the student is encouraged in the home to, to, to succeed in the class, and exactly how the student manages the two worlds. So you can't have one without the other? I don't think anything comes... I remember years ago, Dick Cavett was interviewing Katherine Hepburn and asking her, couldn't she have made it as an actress and also been a mother and had children? And she laughed at him. She, the whole idea that you can have everything in, in, in your life is ludicrous, you know? I made certain sacrifices. I really devoted myself as a young student to reading to, uh, to, a, a, to an appalling degree. I read everything. I read novels and histories. It's, you know, it's, at a very young age, I absorbed this language. I wanted it in my eyes. I wanted to speak it. I wanted to have it. Almost to the point where it became a kind of grotesque, you know. Uh, there was something abnormal about, about the way I was talking, you know, everybody, in fifth grade, there was an assignment to have a book report, and everybody was doing the Babe Ruth story or some baseball novel. And I was reporting on these, these gothic 19th century English novels about romance, you know, Wuthering Heights. And you people know. were going like this. <laughs> yeah, who is this guy? <laughs> um, nonetheless, you know, you, after a while, the language became native to me. I stopped speaking Spanish. Mm. I, it wasn't, it's the most curious thing, but I could still understand it. I could still read it, but I couldn't speak it. It was almost as though there was a kind of block that I just couldn't do it anymore. I met other students who talked that way. Um, D. H. Lawrence was a, uh, the sign of a coal miner in England, um, and when he starts going to school, he stops his speaking his father's broad Derbyshire accent. And you say, "Well, what do you mean you can't do it anymore? It's not in your. Where is it? Where does where it, go? it go? He can't do it. It's almost as though." The words get smothered by some something in this in this m momentum of the word coming forth, and he couldn't do it. He writes romantic novels. Lady Chatterley's Lover is a novel about a, a working class man who speaks broad Derbyshire accent to an upper class woman. They become lovers. Lawrence couldn't do that in his life, and when I read that, I thought, "That's me." That's it. Yes. That's it. Fast forward, 1972. You know, here you are. You're a youngster now. You're in college. And suddenly, um, you, you have this moment, or you have this epiphany of sorts, where you realize that maybe this bilingual education that they are espousing in the schools, maybe that's not such a good idea. No, I don't think, yes, it, it came that way. But I mean, people did not take too kindly to those words. No, I was the first generation of affirmative action, and suddenly people were rewarding me because I had this relationship to Latin America. I had no relationship to but Latin America. But you were America. smart and you had this relationship. But I didn't Latin even America. speak Spanish anymore. I mean, so how could, on what basis was I Hispanic anymore? On what basis was I Latino? I knew more about black civil rights history than I do about Mexican history. I did. I used to go listen to, to Malcolm X in Sac when he came to Sacramento. The whole notion that I was Hispanic and that I, was, I would be rewarded for that. What was my relationship to as a, as a, as a man? to that past, and in what sense should I be rewarded for having brown skin? 
That's what the crisis was. And, and the, the pressure in education was we should teach students to be proud of the fact that they're Lithuanian, that they're Bosnian, that they're, that they're Kurds, that they're Mexicans. We should, and insofar as it's possible, we should encourage that sense of themselves as different people, celebrate diversity. I kept reminding people that the word diversity comes from the word divide, etymologically. And that the whole problem with American education is that we didn't teach children that they had a stake in each other's history. I have a stake in the history of African Americans. It is my history. And knowing it's not, your place in that big picture. That's right. And it's not simply their history, it is my history. You understand? Okay, so yes, but when you're saying this in 1972, when, when this push is toward affirmative action, you, you made a lot of enemies and oh, yes. people, there's, yeah, a lot there's of There's still a lot of schools in the country that I cannot come and speak. I'm considered to be, uh, the term is usually neoconservative. I got a call from the Oprah Winfrey show a few years ago saying that they were going to have a show on self-hating ethnics. People, you know, Norwegians who don't want to be Norwegians, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> so that having been said, and now we've come fast forward from 1972, here we are in 2010. What have we learned along the way? Well, the world, America is a much more international city than the country than it used to be. Uh, we've learned that we are now faced with the problem of what is an American? Uh, what is it kind of, do you teach, a, a, when you have 28 uh, language groups in a classroom, do you teach founding fathers? Is it, or do you, do you, do you, you know, do, do you teach William Faulkner anymore? Or do you look for a Mexican American writer? Do you look for uh, a Lithuanian writer? So students will feel connected to that. I always think that part of the, the problem of education is teaching st students to, to join difference. You're not immediately like me. But in the process of becoming educated, I learn your history. It becomes part of me, you understand? I do, but is assimilation then um, the goal, or is that a negative? I don't think, I don't think assimilation's a bad word. I, I think it's a, the, the, my goal is in some sense to, is to, is to become an American at the deepest level of, of that is to, to consider Thomas Jefferson my cultural forefather, to consider the slave owner, the Democrat, the slave owner, my, my, my cultural father, to understand that I'm related to that as I am related to slaves. That's my, that's the goal. If that's assimilation, then so be it. But there's nothing less than that, it seems to me. Well, you talk a lot about religion, and, um, and when we went into the new millennium, you were talking about how that was going to be the critical key. We're going to talk a little bit more as we uh, take a short break here on Outlook, and when we come back, we'll have more with essayist Richard Rodriguez on Outlook. Don't go away.
program is Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb, and we are rejoined by our guest, Richard Rodriguez, who is a leading American essayist and who uh, caused a lot of people to, to look at him not very nicely when he said he didn't think affirmative action was such a good thing. He thought it gave an unfair advantage to certain people. Bilingual education, maybe not such a great thing in the schools. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Before the break, we did touch on that affirmative action, how uh, maybe it isn't such a good thing. An unfair advantage is given to some because of the color of their skin. Yep. I think that, you know, just as a, speaking politically, the Democratic Party in the 1970s uh, lost the South over the issue of affirmative action. It lost the white working class in the South uh, people who used to be called uh, poor whites in the South. The, the, the Democratic Party used to be a party uh, concerned with, with, with them as much as with blacks or with, with the other groups coming into the country. And, and when it became the case in America that you, you were only disadvantaged if you had a skin color that was not white, I think the Republicans suddenly seized that moment and took over the South, which is, which is what we're living in now. We were talking about uh ethnicity today? What, what does it mean to have ethnicity, to be ethnic in today's world? And, and before the break, I was saying to you, we're, we're snobs. As Americans, for the most part, we're snobbish in the sense that we, we don't encourage other languages. We want people to assimilate to our language. Yeah. Well, what we're trying to do as a culture, though, is so complicated to bring these many people together you can't allow for that much discordance. You know, you have to have some sense of a commonality. That said, you're right. We are a large country. You, you go to most countries in the world and everybody is bilingual. I mean, all students are routinely bilingual. People in Scandinavia speak English better than we do, you know, um, and American English at that. The fact is that, you know, it would be wonderful if I could speak four or five or six languages. The problem with, with being multilingual, though, is, is different than the problem of being bilingual if you are a working class child. If you are a working class child, the problem is that you don't believe it, English is your language, that it belongs to los gringos, it it's belongs like the to the strangers. Isn't there. That's yeah, right. Yeah. And you have to convince students that it is your language, that this is, this is, it belongs in your mouth. The notion that you should be speaking Spanish to those kids is dangerous. There are middle class, upper class schools in, in, in California that, that teach all classes, all, sc all schoolroom classes in Chinese or in Spanish or in French. But those kids are middle class and upper middle class. For them, they know English is their language. So of course they speak Mandarin you know, in, in the classroom without any problem. For a, a group of, of, of Hispanic immigrants in Los Angeles to be sent to a classroom and to be told Spanish is the language we are going to teach you in, is to teach them that English is not their language. You understand? I do. And so what you're saying is this, this buy-in, this ownership is critical to, to the next step, to moving absolutely, forward. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, That's, so I, as a system, how do we do that? How do we do that? We're hearing so much about the failings of the public schools. I heard a report today, a saddening report, how in the state of Georgia they're looking at test scores and how they may have been rigged, erased, and changed, and to reflect better test scores than we're actually had. So, you know, we're doing a disservice to the students in the classroom, but how do we get a grasp of that? I mean, this is a huge issue. Well, I think you teach students not that you're becoming an Englishman by learning American English, but because you what you're doing is you become an American by, by, by speaking this language. And that the language, is, it keeps growing. You know, you and I are descendants of immigrants. And that, that what immigrants did to this culture is they brought language to it. They, there are Italian words. There is Yiddish in the language. There is Spanish in the language. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, our, our great uh, Austrian governor in California, the great bodybuilder himself, is most famous for having said, hasta la vista, baby. I mean that everybody understands that sentence is already an indication that Spanish now is in the American tongue. You teach students that you bring something to the, to the language, not simply that the language changes you. But you know, you also touched on something that I thought was fascinating. It, the generation that you are has a big uh, impact on how you accept this. In other words, if you're a second generation American, if you're a first generation American, very different the way you accept language and being an American. Yes. On the other hand, I mean, one of the things that young people are learning in America at a university like this, somebody told me that seven or eight years ago this, that there was nothing like this ethnic and linguistic variety on campus. Now, now there are students here for whom this will be the normal. 
This is what America is. To see, to, to see Kurdish students, to see Pakistani students, to see Chinese students, to see Mexican students. They're, this new generation is going to see things quite differently in America. And Not only this new generation, but in addition, this is the post-9-11 generation. That's right. Talk a little bit about that, because it will never be the same? No, I don't think it'll be the same. I think, that you, for, for me, September 11th was this enormous catastrophe that was also eye-opening in the sense that I didn't know anything about Islam. I know something about it, but little about it. And here were these men, these terrorists, driving the 757s into the World Trade Center, praising, praising Allah. And I thought to myself, I need to know what this is. And especially since, as a Christian, I'm related to, to Muslims. We are all Abrahamic religions. We all consider Abraham to be the father of our religion. The Jews do. The Christians do, and the Muslims do. We are kin at some level. The Virgin Mary occurs more often in the Quran than she does in the Bible. And I knew nothing about them. So I began, after September 11th, to draw closer to Islam. I, I have been working in the Middle East, thanks to the BBC and National Geographic, wandering around, looking at caves, looking at the desert. I have a Palestinian driver. But who, wait, in search of what? In search of a better I'm understanding? Search, I'm in search of the desert. I'm in search of the relationship of these religions to the, 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 des the desert. We think of, you know, we don't think of, 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 of our Christianity as a desert religion, but it comes out of the desert. The desert God who appears to Abraham and to, and to Moses is a desert God. It's not in the forest. It's not in the seashore. It's in the desert. These are desert religions. What does that tell us about these religions? What does that tell us? What is the, the place? The importance of water, the importance of tribalism. You do not go to the desert by yourself. Jesus does. Abraham does at different times. Uh, uh, Moses does. Uh, Muhammad does. But generally, the desert is a dangerous place to be by yourself. It is a tribal religion. You go in groups, you understand? And, and with the tribe, there are, uh, there are chiefs. And it looks rather like Afghanistan today, you know. You, you don't negotiate with, with, with the members of the, the lowly men, you negotiate with the chieftain. That there is this, I'm, I'm interested in the way the desert shapes the experience of God. That what has heaven become? Heaven becomes an oasis. Heaven becomes, you know, for the Christian and for the Muslim, this, this notion of, of, of palm trees and, and lakes. Um, what is hell? except burning, you know, uh, this, 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 the, 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 I'm, I'm interested in the way these religions are responding to a, an ecology of belief. An ecology of belief, which then takes us back to the question that brought us to this place, which was about the changing face of students today, to the individual, and who has, for a lot of purposes, no understanding of Islam or of these people. I tell students, so if, you don't gradu if you graduate from this university without having some basic experience with Islam, you've been miseducated. If you, if you graduate now without a, 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 being able to think uh, a Sikh from a Muslim, someone who wears a, a, a turban from a Muslim, you've been miseducated. If you don't know what, some basic information about what Buddhists are, you've been miseducated. To, to just sort of wonder, well, I'm sort of a Christian and I... I sort of believe in Christmas, and I like, you know, I like Christmas trees, and, um, and I like the Dalai Lama, you know, I like that. That's not an education. You better know what the world is right now. There are people of your age, 17, 18 years old, I meet them in London, who are angry, and who talk about religious jihad. And you better know, when you're on the subway with them, what their anger is, for your own sake, you understand? For my own sake or for my own safety? For both. For both. Uh, I, you know, I do a lot of interviewing now in, in London. I'm living there part of the time in a neighborhood called Brixton where there are a lot of angry immigrant kids. And, um, and when I'm on the subway on su Saturday night after, after the theater, say, the, the tube is, is packed. And I think about those kids all the time. Their anger, their violence. And it's an ethnic mix. Oh, yes. Houston, yeah. I, I, I went to, when, when the, the students were, 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 were riding in Paris a couple of years ago, I went immediately to Paris to talk to them, North Africans, Arabs. Um, why are you so angry? You know what they were burning? They were burning automobiles. 
Doesn't that interest you? Yes. They were burning mobility, the idea. And what, does get, what gets torn down in New York but a World Trade Center? Everybody speaks in metaphors and in symbols. Listen to them. And we'll leave it on that note. Everyone speaks in metaphors and symbols. Yes. Listen. Listen. What do you have yet to accomplish? I d I'm not brave. I wanted to be brave in my life, and I just wasn't brave. And I've, I'm learning it in late middle age, and it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous to be brave. To it doesn't make any sense. If I was 20, meeting some of the people I meet now, that would have been, that would have been wonderful. But yeah. I'm not 20. So I'm, I'm doing interviews with skinheads, and, but I'm a... I'm, I'm, that's not brave. That's foolhardy. It's foolhardy. There's a difference, indeed. Yeah. Uh, we could go on and on. There's so much more to talk about. His name is Richard Rodriguez. He is an essayist. He is a writer. He is a very interesting human being. And thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you, Barbara. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us. And, of course, if you want to find out more about the programs that you see here on WKYU-PBS, all you have to do is go to our website at WKYU-PBS.com. Until next time, thanks for joining us.